Well, welcome everyone to AU Korea event. I am Jiang Lee, Associate Professor of International Relations and C.W. Lim and KF Professor of Korean Studies at American University. I have the honor today to be moderating this very exciting panel. Joining us from Asia, we have Dr. Ian Henry from Australia, Dr. Yu Gyeong Yeo from South Korea, and Dr. Andrew Yeo from Manila. Um, today's discussion is really about understanding how China's growing power and influence have been affecting the U.S. alliance system in Asia. Today, we would like to particularly examine South Korean and Australian strategies and policies, placing them in a comparative perspective. As you can imagine, today's discussion cannot be any more timely as the newly inaugurated Biden administration is seeking to repair alliance relationship as it is probably making very important decisions about its Asia strategy. Um, before we go on, let me uh, talk about two housekeeping items. One, um, this discussion will last about 70 minutes, um, including about 20 minutes for Q&A. If you would like to ask a question, please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, and second, we are going to record this session and the plan is to make it available. So please do not record this session yourself. Um, now, let me now go ahead and introduce our speakers. Dr. Ian Henry is a senior lecturer in the Strategic and Defense Studies Center at the Australian National University. He's a leading expert in alliance theory and politics, Asian security, the Cold War in Asia, and diplomatic history and Australian strategic policy. His research has been published in International Security, Australian Journal of International Affairs, as well as security challenges. In 2014, he was a visiting Fulbright Scholar at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. A graduate of Australian Defense Force Academy, he has previously worked for the Australian Army, Australian Public Service, and Qantas Airways. So we couldn't find any better person to talk about Australian policies in the age of US-China competition. Dr. Andrew Yeo is a professor of politics at the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. He's currently in Manila on leave. Um, he is the author of Asia's Regional Architecture, Alliances and Institutions in the Pacific Century, which was published with Stanford University in 2019. He's also author or co-editor of three other books, including North Korean Human Rights with Cambridge University, Activists, Alliances, and Anti-US Based Protest, also with Cambridge University Press, and Living in an Age of Mistrust with Routledge Press, which was published in 2017. Andrew is a leading voice in international relations theory, Asian security, the formation of beliefs and ideas, worldviews, civil society, social and transnational movements, U.S. grand strategy, and global force posture, Korean politics, and North Korea. Dr. Yu gyeong Yeo is joining us from South Korea. She is professor of the College of International Studies at Gyeonggi University. She's the author of a variety of state regulation, how China regulates its socialist market economy, which was just published with Harvard University in 2020. Before joining Gyeonggi University, she worked at the City University of Hong Kong as a postdoctoral fellow and also as an assistant professor. Her research in Chinese political economy and foreign economy policy, including state regulation in China's strategic industries, state business relations, institutional changes in the socialist market economy, as well as Chinese foreign aid regime and policies are well regarded within the academic community 
and her research has been published in China Quarterly, Pacific Review, Journal of Contemporary China, and China Review. Ian, Andrew, Yugyeong, it is my great pleasure to have you all in this one space. I greatly look forward to our meaningful discussion. So, without further ado, let me actually move on to questions. Um, my question, uh, the first one will actually go to um, Andrew and Ian. You know, um, basically it's about the Trump presidency and its impact on alliances. So basically what happened to US-Australia and US-South Korea alliance in the last four years? Where do we exactly stand in terms of Seoul's and Canberra's respective relations with Washington as we speak right now. Um, can I ask maybe Ian going first and then Andrew? Sure, thanks, Jiang. It's great to be here. Um, where to begin <laughs> on a very eventful uh, four years, not just in US-Australia relations, but uh, also in Australia-China relations. Um, the first point, I guess, is that uh, although it was never discounted as an impossibility, the Trump victory surprised Canberra uh, and the, especially the degree of skepticism that Trump uh, displayed about the traditional kind of US security role or order upholding role in Asia uh, caused a lot of disquiet in Canberra. And this was intensified by an early interaction between the then Australian Prime Minister and uh, Donald Trump where they had this very acrimonious phone call uh, that was quickly leaked to the, uh, the Washington Post and was one of the, the sort of the early foreign policy scandals of the Trump administration. And again, that feels like three decades ago when I say it, but I do remember that occurring in early 2017. Um, since then, Australia has adopted a couple of different approaches. In, in 2017, it was very anxious and tried to encourage the United States to essentially refocus on Asia, to place a greater emphasis on upholding rules, norms and order and indeed essentially just getting ready to meet whatever challenge uh, China would come to pose. Uh, in 2017, it, I think it really encouraged the United States to step up and simultaneously it also encouraged China to step back. And we said, our foreign minister at the time said some things that were perhaps um, counterproductive or, or were perceived as, um, as quite offensive by Beijing. She talked about wanting to work with like-minded democracies to shape China. And so we had this, these dual messages coming out of Canberra, I think, in 2017. US, please step up. China, please step back. And in 2018, the real shock was um, with the release of the NSS and the NDS, how strongly the United States stepped up. And I think that caused a, um, essentially a bit of concern in Canberra that the United States wasn't interested in upholding order, um, the kind of framework that we had placed around our ideal level of US engagement in the region didn't seem to apply anymore. And there was, I think, a little bit of fear of entrapment or a little bit of fear that perhaps this rhetoric that uh, Mike Pence in particular and then later Mike Pompeo were coming out with was all just a bit too much for Australia to endorse. And indeed, one of these really interesting trends is you see 2017, Australia saying, come on, US, step up, we'll help you out. And in 2018, after um, a couple of speeches from Pence in particular, we don't comment on them, we go very quiet, we don't endorse them. And in fact, since then, we've actually seen on a few occasions Australian leaders try and step back from um, this very binary ideological framed competition that uh, Pence and Pompeo in particular seem to embark on. So a little bit of mixed messages probably coming from Canberra um, and those developing and evolving as the US-China relationship has gone through the ups and downs the last four years. Thank you. Um, Andrew? Thanks, Jiang, and thanks for having us all here on this panel. Uh, I do remember that phone call that Ian mentioned uh, that Trump had with the Australian Prime Minister back in uh, 2017, that was 2016, that was quite jarring. But on the US-South Korea alliance, let me just begin uh, by just talking about the state of the alliance relationship on the whole, because I think it's really easy to just jump in and say that once Trump came in, everything was upended. I mean, there was definitely a lot of issues that had come up. But on the whole, the US-South Korea alliance stayed intact as stakeholders and institutions supporting the alliance, both within and outside of government, worked hard to manage the relationship. So surprisingly on North Korean issues, Moon and Trump were both eager to hold high-level summits with Kim Jong-un 
which allowed for greater opportunities for coordination and cooperation between Seoul and Washington. Even if Trump's inconsistency must have been jarring for our South Korean allies. And I think a lot of people forget that when Trump visited South Korea, um, you know, there, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of positive sentiment coming out. He gave a, a speech at the National Assembly. And so there were some, there were some positives to the alliance relationship. But that being said, uh, of course, Trump did not make things easy for the U.S.-South Korea alliance. He repeatedly questioned the utility of the alliance and called South Korea and other allies free riders while uh, dismissing South Korean contributions to the alliance. And at one point, he demanded a 50% increase in South Korea's burden share contributions, raising South Korea's total from, uh, he was actually demanding uh, South Korea to raise uh, their burden share from $1 billion to $5 billion. Uh, and that's still ongoing, the, the special measure, uh, the special measure agreements. Uh, and, he, you know, Trump would be very cavalier in stating uh, things like the U.S. might, they could pull troops out of South Korea, or there's a period during the Trump-Kim summit where he agreed to suspend joint U.S.-South Korea exercises without informing our South Korean allies. So, uh, on the whole, I think the alliance uh, managed to sustain itself. It's quite flexible, but, um, but there were some jarring moments. But uh, safe to say there was some broad public and elite support for the U.S.-South Korea alliance throughout the Trump period. There's certainly challenges ahead moving forward, even with a new administration that takes alliance relationships more seriously. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where things go with the Biden administration. Thank you for these great overviews. Uh, my next question goes to Yu Gyeong. Um, you know, during the Trump administration, clearly there has been a change in United States approach to China, you know, US-China policy. Um, I'm wondering how China is interpreting that change in the policy and responding to it. And my second question relatedly is, how does that change China's calculations towards South Korea and Australia um, when China is having this much tougher, you know, attitude and policies coming from the United States? If you can kind of elaborate on these two points. Uh, thank you, Ji Young. So I think China is well aware this Biden administration will not bring about any kind of substantial or meaningful policy change toward China because it was bipartisan kind of approach toward China reciprocity and more tough some kind of policy toward particularly technology and other things. So the China know that the kind of restriction and ban on Chinese company and technology will be maintained. But they have some kind of hope that Biden administration will have more consistency uh, towards some um, Chinese um, technology or company or government so that Chinese government can better prepare what to do or how can negotiate with this American administration. So, so at the same time, so China is speeding up some localization. They are key technology, particularly semiconductor, as you know, because the semiconductor is a fundamental for 5G network and technology. So, uh, so in that sense, maybe um, China, Chinese 5G technology, I think in the near future will be in trouble because this continued restriction to access American semiconductor technology and network and some clouding computer system and everything, we have big kind of blow to Chinese plan and strategy and China 2025, some kind of strategy. So in that sense, I think in terms of technology, they are kind of different standard or some kind somehow decoupling will be more accelerated in the future, I guess. Mm -hmm. So at the same, uh, you asked me like how change in United States policy toward China affect American ally, right? So from my understanding, maybe uh, this US ally come to have a more space to maneuver the national priority against China. So particularly for South Korea, 
maybe we have a more option to deal with China about North Korea or some kind of peace process of Korean Peninsula. So I think for South Korea, we have more opportunity to better, to have a better negotiation with China. So I think it's a good signal. That actually brings us to my next question, which is about um, how South Korea and Australia has been responding to the US-China competition. You know, when the two countries are in competition, actually that place put a lot of um, challenges to Australian and South Korean foreign policies, include especially its China policy, right? So, um, and of course, Washington and Beijing will expect, um, you know, Canberra and Seoul to join their position, you know, this policy enlightenment question. So my next question is, how have South Korea and Australia uh, responded to Beijing, Washington um, strategic competition? And um, what are their strategies and policies? So let me actually start with Ian. It appears that China's Austra Australia's China policy actually has gone through some important changes around 2017. Um, can you elaborate on Australian thinking on these questions? Uh, yeah, I can't elaborate on what the people in government are thinking. I can elaborate on what it seems like to, a, to an external observer for sure. Um, 2017 was a year where I think uh, it was a real turning point and things definitely did change in the Australia-China relationship. Um, there were revelations that um, the Chinese government had essentially tried to um, donate money and acquire political influence in Australia. We have some fairly lax laws on foreign donations to political parties. And this is, um, you know, I don't think they gained any immense amount of influence. Um, I don't think the fact that they were doing these things was all that surprising to anyone who knows how the intelligence world works. Um, but it was a huge shock and it was a particularly a shock for the Australian people. Um, this was a year where almost every week on um, the Australian uh, government funded TV channels, ABC and the like, you would see exposés and revelations about all this new, um, all, all this newly revealed activity. and. Particularly uh, one moment towards the end of 2017, where our then Prime Minister uh, talked about the new laws that were being introduced to counter this kind of activity, and he proclaimed the Australian people have stood up, of course, invoking Mao back in 1949. And I think this was the point where um, the PRC essentially said, or decided to put Australia in the deep freeze. And, and since then, we have probably endured the, the four most difficult years in the Australian-China relationship. And it seems that almost every month we plumb new depths and, and discover just how bad it can get. Um, the Chinese view, it seems, at least sometimes, has been that this is a function of Australia's relationship with the United States and that Australia has made decisions um, to push back on certain activities because of that relationship. I think that fundamentally misunderstands the dynamic that's at play here. Um, no small state is a satellite or a, or a um, wholly dependent and controlled client of its great power protector, and we are certainly not. There are a lot of things that we have done that would displease the Americans, such as joining the AIIB, despite their encouragement to not do so, uh, and also things that we haven't done, despite US urging, and I'm thinking here of things like freedom of navigation operations. But we have reached a rather um, unfortunate position where there are there is simply no domestic political penalty to be paid in Australia for being seen as tough on China. And indeed it's largely a positive. And we have got ourselves into a position where uh, essentially I think there are probably elements of government that measure the success of their foreign policies by whether it annoys China. Um, personally, in my view, it's, it would not be a particularly widely held view in Australia. I think we have, have done things that, um, and said things more particularly, that were needlessly provocative and didn't actually contribute to any significant policy goal. And that of course raises the question of the necessary pushback that's occurred in things like foreign interference laws, in things like ensuring that um, Huawei 5G technology isn't um, in, our, in our new telecommunications networks. Those kinds of things um, could have been done without the fanfare and without a little bit of self-congratulations on the, the part of some people. Um, 
very quickly, I think it's worth noting here that the commentariat in Australia, I would actually describe as being more hawkish than the actual government policies are. Um, and indeed, when we look very closely at what Australian political leaders have said, they have tried to not buy into the US-China security competition. Um, you know, I'm thinking of a number of times, Scott Morrison told a, um, a Chinese uh, media outlet that we have independent relationships with both the United States and China. And if there were ever tensions, we would try and de-escalate from a position of friendship with both sides. Um, during the Osmin 2 plus 2 uh, meeting last year, Pompeo got up and railed about the evils of the Chinese Communist Party uh, for about three minutes, doing his best John Foster Dulles impersonation from the 1950s. And the Australian Foreign Minister stood up and said, the Secretary's views are his own and Australia's views are our own. A really stark, deliberate putting of distance um, between the two countries on their views on China. So it's a, it's a really mixed picture because Australia certainly has done things that um, have pushed back against Chinese influence or Chinese behaviour, but that has not been kind of at the behest or the command of the Americans. And indeed, there is more than visible daylight, I would say, between the old conception of great power competition as advanced by Pence and Pompeo and what Australian leaders have been happy to sign up to and endorse. Thank you. Andrew, how about South Korea? You know, until a few years ago, I used to think that South Korea and Australia in a similar situation when it comes to having to kind of strike the balance between Beijing and Washington. But then it seems that in 2020, there is a clear kind of contrasting trajectory between Seoul and Canberra. What are your thoughts? I know you have some work done on, you know, Indo-Pacific strategy and in South Korea's own, you know, Southern policy. So can you elaborate on South Korean thinking and policies? Sure. Um, yeah, South Korea and Australia are two contrasting tales to how a country might navigate between US-Sino rivalry. And I should just say at the outset, uh, one of the distinctions between Australia and South Korea is that in, uh, in Seoul, in South Korea, you don't have as much of that element of domestic interference or foreign uh, Chinese foreign influence within South Korean domestic politics. So I think that's helped uh, make, uh, make it be, become less of a political football than it has been in Australia. So there's, uh, there's, that, there's that distinction. But at the same time, at the international level, at the systemic level, uh, South Korea does feel that pressure uh, that, uh, that Australia does coming from its alliance partnership with the U.S. and then with, with China. But South Korea has been much more cautious in aligning itself to the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, out of fear that it might cross China. So unlike Australia, they have not embraced the strategic elements of the Indo-Pacific strategy, even though they're fully cognizant of China's coercive influence in the region. So they've, uh, Seoul's really tried to, uh, keep, I don't want to say keep its distance, well, keep its distance maybe is, is an accurate um, assessment, but there is dialogue with the United States. It's not that they completely ignore the Indo-Pacific, but in terms of the language and the narrative of the Indo-Pacific, they don't want to be seen as part of a, a strategic alliance trying to choke or contain China. And I know there's been some discussion about the quad you know, between US, uh, India, Japan, and Australia. And I've also been getting a lot of questions about whether you know, South Korea is going to join this or what happens if the Biden administration asks South Korea to be a member. Um, I should say that South Korea has already participated informally in discussions with uh, quad country members and, and what's been dubbed these days as the quad plus. So Seoul hasn't rejected the quad entirely. I think it was last year in March that, there, that South Korea had joined in on an informal discussion with other foreign ministers of the quad. But a key concern for South Korea is if its participation, if it participates in a more formalized way, uh, or if the Quad Plus becomes more formalized, that that would, and if the focus uh, becomes much more on China, uh, the question for Seoul is whether there would be repercussions from Beijing. Um, of course, the United States would welcome Seoul's participation, but uh, it, this is probably going to be something that's going to be discussed between the Moon administration and the new Biden administration. Thank you. So let's bring this question about, you know, South Korean and Australian responses. Yu-Gyeong, I wonder how, 
you know, the responses and policies coming from Seoul and Canberra actually matter um, from the perspective of Beijing when it is thinking about its own competition with Washington. What do you think? Uh, to be honest, um, I think uh, China holds most of the cards because China has the capacity to impose high cost in South Korea and Australia, as, as you see how Australia suffer at a low cost to itself. So China seems to be concerned, but um, I don't think China that much worry about how, how what kind of policy South Korea and Australia finally like, like uh, they, they 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 have so uh, and just we talk about some kind of quad and quad plus that kind of possibility but i'm kind of skeptical about south korea will join actively and quad plus dialogue and discussion with the united states in any time soon because um you can see from the this uh, united states led this ban on Huawei. South Korea never joined and never really clearly talk about what kind of approach South Korean government will take it. So meaning that the United States read ban on Huawei and 5G network, I don't think it's going to be work out. So I think the Biden administration will, will modify, will, will modify mm -hmm. in a more acceptable way for Asian ally because when I, when I attend some kind of conference in South Korea and most of experts about China and international relations, they more care about business opportunity, business opportunity and, and at the same time, United States, particularly during Trump administration, is kind of reluctant. What kind of things, um, when, when South Korea suffer from this kind of trade retaliation and coercion, what United States as a lie you can do. And most of the people in Korea, like, like administration and also academia, we are, we are kind of disappointed and not sure, you know? So, so I don't think South Korea will have, in the end, I don't think China's uh, South Korean government will have clear position toward Quad and Quad Plus and even though US emphasized alliance in this new administration. That's my observation. So thank you. Let's actually expand this discussion a little bit. You know, one of the forms of Chinese uh, influence comes in the form of Chinese ability to use its economic power and turn it into strategic leverage, right? And some people argue that BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, is an example of China's growing international, you know, status, you know, and um, an attempt to create perhaps an alternative kind of international order. Now, Actually, let me go back to you again a little bit first. Um, how important is it from Chinese perspective for Beijing to have, say, Canberra and Seoul on board, you know, from the perspective of its, you know, BRI and other uh, international initiatives that China is um, implementing? Um, I think this kind of question, I was thinking about your question when I prepared. So, so about with respect to Chinese ultimate purpose, I think that China actually raised very important question in Asia and beyond. So what does it mean? So for me, like China raised the question like state-led technology and innovation, at the same time, state-led infrastructure investment and project are feasible and competitive in some respect. So this itself shows that United States red river international system and rule and order, maybe not the only one, the country in the world we can follow. So it does not directly challenge or reject this US red international river international order, but you know, provide alternative. So you don't like it, you can just take this. And it's very attractive, particularly for authoritarian country or developing country. So in that sense, 
so this is so this is my observation. So somehow some some scholar also talk about this. Maybe in Asia, maybe we're gonna have two kinds of order: so security order and economic order. And security because we, we Asia particularly crowded with this American line. So security maybe United States have more initiative and leadership, but in economy, I don't think the U.S. cannot catch up in China in the future. It is, it's going to be, China has more potential to grow, even though they have a lot of some economic problem and debt, but still urbanization is still around 40%, there are more to go. So in terms of economy in Asia, I think China has more kind of leading position to make order and law and providing some opportunity and, and, and so on. So I see. Thank you. It, it, it sounds like, so basically China has this alternative competing vision of international order that is captured in um, international institution, you know, such as BRI, you know. Yeah. Um, let me go to Andrew and Ian. Um, should the United States be worried about, um, say, Australia and South Korea joining China-led international initiatives such as BRI? What do you think? Oh, maybe Andrew, you can go first. Is uh, it? Uh, I mean, the answer is it depends. So, so yeah. yes and no. And you know, Ian had mentioned Australia's participation the AIIB. I remember I, I was it back in 2015. I, I don't know how long ago it was, but I also made the same case too. I don't think Washington needs to fret about its allied uh, its allies joining a, a Chinese-led multilateral uh, a development bank. Um, Especially if, if some of the institutions that the Chinese are setting up help uh, address uh, public goods issues or, if, or goods that can help uh, enhance regional governance. So I don't think they should be categorically rejected. But it also depends on what goals and allies have in mind when they join these Chinese-led initiatives too. Uh, so uh, you mentioned the BRI and the Belt and Road Initiative, and it's a very large and kind of amorphous uh, project that the Chinese are leading, which has strategic implications. And the, you know, there are a number of ways which US allies could potentially contribute to the infrastructure needs uh, within the region. But then we also have to ask, would financing and investment through the BRI, would it follow the same global standards as those that are set by the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank or US-led initiatives within what the US has called the Blue Dot Network. So I think Japan and Australia are the two countries that are part of this, where they have certain uh, standards, financial, you know, environmental, sustainable development that should be met when you do development projects. So, uh, so, so the Chinese have their own way of doing um, investment, but there are, other, there are other alternatives as well too. And so, uh, so you do have to ask that question, what is the purpose of you know, the Japanese or the Koreans uh, getting involved in the BRI. Um, so there are opportunities to work with the Chinese and there's no need to discourage countries from doing so if the projects are transparent and follow international standards. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not the case with many BRI projects, which are, uh, which are you know, mostly financed bilaterally by, uh, by the Chinese and Chinese banks. Um, so, so again, the answer is it depends. I don't think we should be categorically uh, you know, putting our foot down and telling allies not to join Chinese-led institutions, but uh, allies should uh, really think about what the purpose, um, what the purpose of, of joining these institutions really are. And I, I hear that maybe actively uh, looking to see if there are voice opportunities shaping the institutional mm -hmm. apparatus and the outcomes. Um, um, Ian? Yeah, there is, um, zero chance of Australia formally, I think, participating in any further BRI um, initiatives. There was a case of, a, of an MOU signed uh, between a state government here in, in Australia, and that still is quite a political football. Um, so I, I don't think, I don't see that happening. It's it's a bit out of my, my expertise area, but I think, <clears throat> excuse me, where we will see um, some concern is, I think Australia is watching with great degree of apprehension what China might be planning in, in terms of investment in the Southwest Pacific, which we have generally regarded as our backyard and our, although we actually, we have used this phrase formally in recent years, our sphere of influence. Um, and 
we are extremely panicky at any hint that China is funding some kind of investment there or telecommunications network or a port or anything like that. Um, and indeed, I, th I think that's where Australian concerns will be focused of, of, yes, we have all these standards, we have multilateral mechanisms. Um, are they being funded well enough? I think is probably a big question. I think it was the Blue Dot Network where there was a, 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 a sort of a mini lateral announcement and it came with $150 million of startup funding. And the, the kind of the response seemed to be million, million with an M and not a B. Oh, okay, this isn't very serious. Um, compared to the willingness of China to throw money around in these places. Um, that's going to be a big challenge for us. And I don't see how Australia is going to win bidding wars if we decide to participate in those. So, um, you know, to what degree we accept some of that as inevitable in the end or to what degree we try and um, prevent it or compete is, is still up for grabs, I think, or, or still uh, yet to be determined. But just to give you a, a sort of a sense of just how um, instinctively or, or consistently hostile Australia seems to be to certain forms of, of Chinese investment. Now, there was a case, I think it was uh, maybe mid last year, where there was foreign ownership of, um, of a milk products company that was going to go from, I think, Japanese to, a, to Chinese ownership. And it was vetoed on national interest grounds, but never explained why. So we are actually in an interesting, I think, foreign investment environment at the moment in Australia, where certain, um, you know, a real microscope is being run over certain um, Chinese foreign investment decisions, but no reasons being really provided why as to as, as to why some of those are being vetoed or or, um, or not being permitted. So we're going to have to wait and see. I think on that. Thank you. Yes, I I see that increasingly in terms of responses to U.S.-China competition, you know, domestic politics definitely is uh, one of the critical factors that shapes their um, policies and responses. So um, this. Uh, my next question actually go to all the speakers. Um, you know, what's really um, interesting, not interesting, I don't know if it's the right word. China is the top training partner for both South Korea and Australia. And, you know, throughout Obama, Trump, and the Biden administrations, you know, U.S. policy goal is to strengthen existing alliances with its Asian partners, right? So given that Chinese economic influence, and I think you can really kind of encapsulated that rising influence in the economic realm and how it you know, also means in the event and under the condition that Beijing has diverging interests with Beijing in technology and other areas, it's going to pose uh, greater challenges than before when Chinese economy influence was not as great as today for the United States. So um, basically, what do you think are going to be, what, what do you think Biden administration should do? And what are Canberra's and um, you know, Seoul's expectations towards Biden administration? Um, you know, it's, a, it's a fact that their economic future is very much tied to their relations with China. But of course, they would you know, very, be very interested in keeping good alliance relations, you know, with Washington. So um, any reaction to that um, dilemma? Um, you can, you wanna go first? Uh, yes, yeah, so, um, this Biden administration emphasize alliance, so, for Korean scholar and most people in Korea, we have a big uh, kind of concern about economy when we join actively America Red Security Alliance in the future. So for me, what is some kind of some maybe possible option is to make this alliance better work, I think United States need to create some kind of more economic alliance initiative, not just a military one. Because as you see this Asian country, the top trade partner is China. So, so, so what, what is the proposal of this economic alliance initiative? So basically it's kind of some mobilizing collective action when you're a lie, a bully or coerced, right? So that 
so that it can raise up some kinds of cost for China to take this kind of portion or option, right? So why this kind of important? Because in the end, this strategic game in Asia, and I think you can see also the Europe, it just they sign up some investment to deal with China and you, Germany will be more, will be more enthusiastic to improve or expand this investment kind of opportunity with China in the future. So it's going to be this game in Asia will be economic. And I don't, I'm not saying this military alliance does not important and it's not important anymore, it's important. So that we have to make more, some kind of some collective action for this economic, some kind of pressure or coercion in the future. And this alliance should make do something else. So what I'm hearing from you, Gyeong, thank you, is that in order for the United States to, you know, from the U.S. perspective to stay, um, you know, to be the leading power in the region, you know, United States should be an important consideration for these um, Asian powers' economic future as well as security. Okay, great. Um, let me go to Andrew. Sure. I mean, fo yeah, focusing uh, more on the economic aspect of U.S. South Korea relations. I mean, I, <clears throat> yeah, I'll just jump in on I'll jump in uh, to where uh, Yuging left off. I mean, there is this feeling that the U.S. for the past four years under Trump has not really had a economic strategy for Asia, and this had to do with Trump pulling out of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, from was it like day three or? day two of his administration, I don't know, very early. Um, and so that with that economic component missing, it seems like there isn't, there isn't really a, a base for it. And so it's, it'll be interesting to see if the Biden administration tries to come up with a different type of, of multilateral um, you know, trade strategy for Asia. You know, he's been uh, reluctant to, he hasn't been, uh, he hasn't jumped onto the TPP bandwagon. He was critical of it in the past. But it'll be interesting to see if that's the platform that he uses to try to uh, bring about a stronger economic plat uh, economic platform. And of course, there's also the whole investment uh, angle, the investment financing in Asia. I think the U.S. has done more on that front, at least under the Trump administration. Um, I'll say one other thing that the Biden administration that can do is not that's not directly that's not directly strengthening trade and economic ties with its allies is actually finding. Um, uh, finding some stability in U.S.-China trade relations, because as we've seen uh, in the past four years, you know, U.S.-China you know, trade negotiations, trade relations have been going up and down so much that other countries in the region have become collateral damage. It's very hard for them to uh, keep up with what all the tariffs are. And they, I mean, they, they've taken a hit because of U.S.-China trade relations, uh, because the souring of U.S.-China trade relations. So if the U.S. can also figure out a way to... Um, restore the economic relationship, the economic component uh, with, with China, that actually could be helpful for allies um, as well too. But I do agree with Yugang that there is, uh, I think the Biden administration will need to craft some kind of uh, economic strategy for the region as well too, and not uh, divorce uh, the strategic elements from, from the economic ones, which I think was the case uh, the past few years. Thank you. I hear that that actually will be an important signal uh, on the part of Asian powers regarding U.S. commitment towards the region. Um, Ian? Uh, these, I think our three contributions here line up very, very neatly uh, because I don't think it's simply the case that um, there's collateral damage from or, or sort of fallout from Sino-U.S. trade relations. But indeed, I think that there have been various points where China has, in a very cunning way, actually, use that to try and uh, perhaps create wedge issues in alliances. So uh, our barley exports to China were um, subject to a rather large tariff. Uh, I think it was maybe mid last year. And the week before that, as part of the kind of the, the US uh, China trade tensions, Beijing had agreed to increase its purchases of US barley quite significantly. So this was a case I believe where, um, you know, Australia's loss was definitely the United States gain. And that's not how alliances ideally work. They're about the, um, you know, they're not ideally zero sum endeavors where one partner's gain is coming at the expense of the other partner. Mm -hmm. And so this will be, I think, a, a key area. 
it's not an area which escaped the attention of the last US administration. Um, I've read somewhere, I forget where, that we all know the declassified Indo-Pacific strategy report kind of thing that came out um, thanks to Matt Pottinger. There was an economic uh, kind of twin to that document um, that I think was not quite declassified in time or perhaps they decided against declassifying it. And I had to sort of have a, have a bit of a chuckle at that because whatever is in that strategy, it doesn't seem to have worked in Australia's case because we have been on the receiving end of, of essentially trade punishment from China for over a year now. And I, I don't think it shows any sign of abating or, or getting better. So, um, you know, the economic stuff is a bit beyond me and a bit out of my uh, area of expertise, but this seems to be something that we should have been prepared for quite some time ago. Um, it seems that we haven't been, and I don't see the obvious answer to um, to the, the the way in which China might use its economic might. Some of it may simply be bearing the costs and grinning and demonstrating that we are willing to do so. Um, but what's disturbing, or what's disturbed me a little bit so far, is just how um, simplistic and perhaps a little bit naive some of the um, the attitudes are. There was this whole effort of, well, all the quad partners will buy more Australian red wine, and you know that'll that'll be a nice little show of resolve and and show Beijing that they can't um, attack us like this and. I, I, you know, economically, I just don't think that makes sense. I don't think the numbers will ever line up in the way that, um, you know, it might replace um, what is that very, very large Chinese middle class market. Thank you. Um, we're almost coming to an end of our discussion. And then in about three minutes, we're going to open it up to the Q&A portion of the event. Um, but my last um, question is to all the speakers, what do you think in terms of you know in terms of international order what kind of order do you think is in the making some people um are worried that the you know post-war us-led liberal international order is in decline and um there's this emerging um spheres of international in, in influence type you know condominium between us and china um what do you think it's happening in Asia in terms of international order? Let me start with Andrew. Sure. Uh, now, that a lot of scholars have weighed in on this, and I've, and I've written about this in my book as well, too, about what sort of order uh, is emerging. And you know, there are really three choices. There's you know, the current uh, liberal hegemonic order. There's a Chinese-led order. Um, and then there's uh, some type of bifurcation, or you, know, you referred to it as spheres of, spheres of influence. But I would say, I mean, I don't think we can go back uh, to the past. It's true that U.S. relative power is declining, and China is becoming stronger. It's, it's, it's going to be, it's just going to become more important in the future. But, um, but for me, and I've, I've kind of cheated. I've, I've said that there's a, a modified liberal hegemonic order. Others have said this as well too, but there is, so it's going to be a liberal hegemonic order, maybe not necessarily just the United States, so a modified order that allows for room for other powers. And the reason why I say this is because, um, you know, the answer to this question about order is it really comes down to what regional actors want. It's how, how are the states, how are Asian states responding um, to these, these shifts, uh, these power shifts and shifts in norms. And you now I'll say that Asian allies, they want freedom of Asian countries, not just allies, but they want freedom of navigation to the global commons. They don't want to be coerced or bullied. And uh, you know, they'll, they'll to some degree need the US support for this. And so if we ask you know, how many countries will run to China um, for protection or how many will uh, run to China to uh, ensure that there's stability uh, within the region. And I mean, there might be a few countries, but I would still say on the whole that there is, uh, there is some preference for, for the U.S. So the U.S. has to play smart and just, uh, step up a little bit and, and coordinate with its allies. And so for that reason, I, I would say that the future is really going to be a modified liberal hegemonic order. Okay, so we have one vote for modified liberal international order. Let me go to Yuga. What do you think? You have to unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself, Yuga. Thank you. So, so, so many scholars 
have some kind of expectation, the future international order, maybe the manage the competition between China, between this great power and China and the United States. But I guess in the short term, maybe we're gonna have a more confrontation and conflict than cooperation. So why? Because I think they have fundamental difference in terms of ideology and ideology. And you, as you know, this ideology is not easy to compromise. And I don't think China will back down. And Xi Jinping's China is different kind of China than Deng Xiaoping and Hu Jintao and Zhang Zemin. So, and we never know China, Xi Jinping will step down in 2022. Supposed to be, but I don't think so because there is no lineup clear, right? So I think we have to prepare <laughs> more confrontation and conflict. But but of course there are there are some kind of area U.S. China can have a better cooperation like climate change or some kind of pandemic. But there are very clear kind of conflict area like technology and also human rights is coming and also some kind of investment, some kind of issue, right? So, so we will see, but I don't think only one kind of paradigm will lead the world or the region in the future. And there are more competition and, and like the small country like South Korea, we have to be more, take more strategic calculation <laughs> to survive wisely. <laughs> intensified competition um, yeah. in shifting power balances, okay? Ian? What worries me when I think about this question is the tendency of US strategic planners to view their presence in Asia as a bit like the hokey pokey, as either being in or out, and there's no middle ground. Either a defensive line is right up against the Chinese mainland, or we pull back to the, you know, to San Diego or to Hawaii and Guam, um, you know, perhaps as, a, as a, a bit of an extension. Um, and what worries me is that there will be conceptions of order that are the same. Either we have the old school, pre-GFC, pre-China's rise, um, liberal international order, which I don't think exists, but let's go with the term, um, that is run by the United States, or we will have an authoritarian, illiberal, repressive, interventionist, Chinese-led order. Um, what worries me, I think, is the determination of people sometimes to only see those as the two possibilities, at least in Australia, I should say, they are often couched as the only two options that exist. It's either side with the US or surrender your autonomy and become a vassal state. Um, and what worries me in particular is the, that allies uh, may encourage the United States to think in such terms, particularly with regards to some of its defensive commitments. And I can, I can see this emerging now. People are sort of saying it'll all be on Taiwan. If the US does not defend Taiwan, it should pack up and go home or it will, it must pack up and go home. And I don't think that's the case. There were similar fears, of course, as the United States thought about how to get out of Vietnam. And it was a different order when the United States did so. It was not the same pre-1972 order, but it was an order that states made work. And indeed, I think that's going to be the challenge. The Australian Prime Minister actually said something um, reasonably revealing late last year where he talked about how greater latitude will be required from the world's largest powers to accommodate the individual interests of their partners and allies. We all need a bit more room to move, was what he said. And I thought that actually summed things up rather nicely, but what, uh, what was missing was any vision of how to create an order where that, or, or create the circumstances in which an order likely to allow that is, is you know, the prospects for that are better. So yeah, my fear is that we will wind up in a position where we appear to be, um, have a choice of two different orders. And yeah, I'm sorry to give such an unsatisfying answer, but at least from the Australian point of view, we keep dropping these hints that we want the order to evolve in a way that acknowledges China's rise. And, you know, we have foreign officials saying things like, um, you know, when China rises, it'll be afforded great power uh, rights and those kinds of things and respect. Um, but we never seem willing to operationalize that in any firm way. And I think that's actually, at least for Australian um, foreign policy, the primary challenge of the next 10 years. Thank you so much. Of course, realities are very complex and, um, and it's difficult to um, really 
consider and implement nuances, but you know, it seems that that's what we need. Um, now we have about 15 minutes or so for question and answer session. Um, I have um, two questions um, already on the chat box. Um, for those who would like to ask a question, please feel free to uh, write down the questions in the chat box and I will read those questions out loud. So first question goes to um, Yu Gyeong Yeo. This is from Eric, uh, our student at SIS. He asks, the South Korean public seems to be against Chinese influence. If a conservative administration gets elected to the Blue House. What is the possibility for South Korea to join the Quad? It's a um, very much SIS student like question. <laughs> um, it's difficult to answer for now, but uh, from political side, maybe there are there is more possibility to join this Quad Plus Three. Because, as you know, this conservative politician in South Korea is more strong. It's more it's more strong position toward North Korea issue, right? So, and, and emphasize U.S. China, uh, U.S. Korea alliance. But at the same time, we have to consider some economic uh, interest group and this business group, and they are more reluctant to have some kind of struggle or conflict with China. So even though, so, so my answer is that like, even though the, even though the uh, conservative party get into blue house, it's not easy to make quick decision and maybe more cautious mm -hmm. to move on mm -hmm. and, and see around between US and China what is going on. So that, so, so we, we will see. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Next question uh, is, given the stagnation on open transfer with ROK US Alliance, consistently delayed for years, and the desire for a tighter military relationship with Australia, what does the panel assess as the future of the security aspects of the alliances, particularly in areas commonly referred to as the global commons? Does Washington and indo PACOM continue to be seen as a viable security partner? Any thoughts on the future of these military relationships in the context of increasing PLA capabilities and regional presence? I, I can jump in first on that. I, I, it seems like the question was addressed to all the panelists. Uh, this is where the U.S. is really, and I think the Biden administration should really try to move forward with multila uh, multilateralism. You know, we always think about bilateral alliances and multilateral institutions, but we've seen for the past decade, the U.S. really trying to promote intra-security or intra-alliance partnerships, so connecting the spokes within the hub and spokes, mm -hmm. um, coming up with other groupings like the Quad and emphasizing this. And the reason why is because uh, it's absolutely correct that the Chinese, uh, the PLAN is becoming more powerful. Uh, the U.S. is not going to be able to secure the global commons on its own. It's going to require help. It's going to require a partnership from other countries. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's been so much more attention to the Quad. But that's just only one aspect of you know, multilateralizing uh, bilateral relationships. And you know, this thing about intra-alliance partnerships uh, things like the U.S. Japan you know, Australia trilateral relationship, or you know, U.S. and Australia, uh, these are all uh, part of uh, part of the answer to this question about global commons. And so, it's not just centered longer on, on Washington D.C., but it's 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 this larger network that we're uh, that we're thinking about that that needs to be uh, strengthened to address uh, address uh, address these issues. I mean, the, the other option, of course, would be going the, uh, the route of diplomacy, of trying, of, of having dialogue with the Chinese, but so far that hasn't really gotten us anywhere. You look at the 
and a code of ASEAN code of conduct, the discussion between ASEAN and China. I mean, these things are going to just go on forever and ever without any resolution. So uh, we should resort to both dialogue and um, and perhaps more coercive means. Uh, right now, just between the global commons, I think we do need to see multilateralization of bilateral alliances. Thank you. Ian, did you want to jump in? Yeah, um, I'm a little bit more skeptical than Andrew, I think, on that note, um, because uh, I've just had difficult it has been in Asia previously to identify the common interests that would bring mm -hmm. a large group of, ally of states together into an alliance like construct or an alliance itself. Um, CETO, of course, having fizzled mm -hmm. rather famously during the Laotian Civil War and things like that. Um, and I think at the moment we're, we're in this bit of um, an interesting fra phrase or interesting phase, sorry, where there's lots of flirting going on almost between some of these states and, and possible alignments, but there's you know very little dating or, or anything more serious going on, it seems. And we, we hear these great pro proclamations about how this country and that country are like-minded on particular issues. Um, and I think the reason we haven't yet seen uh, a greater intensification of that cooperation is for, for a couple of reasons. First is that when states try and sit down and actually identify the interests for which they would bleed, or at least run significant risks of having to bleed for, the areas of convergent or overlapping interests are not as extensive as might have initially been assumed and or they are in scenarios where alliances pre-existing alliances might not necessarily um, take on that greater role um, they may be things that can be formed on an ad hoc basis uh, as issues arise uh, and of course perhaps the the very formation of more formal alliances would um, create their own problems with security dilemmas and, and things like that um, or fears of abandonment and entrapment so I'm a little bit more skeptical um, on that. And again, that, that's going to be kind of one of these things. I'm a, I'm a little bit cautious that some of these things are being set up as, you know, if we don't get together on a particular and we don't agree on, on, on how to re respond to things, that that will be a, a sign of terminal US decline and, and departure from the region. I don't, I don't think that's the case. And um, indeed, it'll be very hard to find sort of the, the lowest common denominator on which a wide group of nations can agree uh, and find significantly likely enough to go to that extent of preparing an alignment or a multilateral alliance. Thank you, thank you. These are great insights. Let me move on to the next question. Um, thank you for the perfect discussion. What do you think about the US-China trade war? How will it end? Because there are lots of economic factors and political factors affect the trade war. Besides, will the propaganda affect the trade war? Anyone wants to take on? I'll chime in and I'll just say that I think a different tone could improve uh, not just the the trade situation between China and the United States, but the um, the broader relationship. I mean, look, you know, the stuff on Pao was saying and that Pence was saying, we have not heard since John Foster Dulles in the 1950s. And indeed, I think Pompeo probably went a bit beyond some of the things that Foster said. So, you know, that, that kind of stuff may not be determinative, but it has an influence and it has a, an impact. And it's very hard um, to take people seriously when they're denouncing your entire way of government and, and then proclaiming on, on um, in other areas of, of the relationship an intent to get along and not cause trouble. Um, so yeah, I, I think it is possible that the, the, the relaxation or the, uh, the absence of that invective that was previously deployed under the Trump administration could at least make the, the conditions a bit more conducive to improvement. Thank you. I do agree that language matters in many settings and circumstances. Okay, let's go to the next question asked by um, our another SIS student, Melissa. How do you think the 100th anniversary of CCP and Xi Jinping's incoming re-election campaign will influence their strategy in the Indo-Pacific? So basically, domestic politics influence in China's Asia strategy. And let me actually read the next question as well, because uh, we're running out of time. 
Um, this one goes specifically to um, Professor Yao. Well, actually, there are two Professor Yao's, so whoever picks it up. <laughs> Will South Korean strategy evolve to enhance ties with other nominally unaligned states in the region, um, as an example of Vietnam? Have there been any intra-Asian developments to support some form of international order beyond U.S.-China competition. Yeah, I, I can take the second question and, and be very brief on the first. Um, about South Korea's strategy, I, mean, they, I haven't mentioned this. I'm doing a little bit of work, though, on South Korea's new southern policy, where South Korea has reached out to ASEAN, the 10 ASEAN countries in India, uh, to try and build partnerships. But the New Southern Policy, the NSP, it's not, it's not um, a strategic framework. It's, it's, it's more uh, economic in nature. And so, you know, she, Vietnam was specifically pointed out. I think Vietnam is the largest uh, economic partner for South Korea within ASEAN. So right now, there isn't really too much discussion on um, forming security ties. It's been more uh, economic. But one of the reasons for this, of course, which uh, the Moon government has mentioned is it's because they see that, uh, you know, there are vulnerabilities to being completely reliant on China. And so Southeast Asia uh, allows for another, I mean, it's, it's another outlet. So, and ASEAN is in the same boat as well, too. So they, these are uh, middle, these middle countries and these middle powers, they, they have each other uh, to, re to rely on. Uh, I do want to mention though that I've heard that there's more uh, there have been some arms agreement, uh, so, so there's been some sales of military equipment from South uh, Korea to the Philippines, uh, to Indonesia, and to Malaysia. I mean, I think it's very small scale still, but from what I've heard, the South Koreans, they don't, they certainly don't want to formalize any kind of security partnership. And unlike Japan or maybe even Australia, you don't see South Korea in the business of uh, security partnerships because they don't want to signal uh, publicly that they have that you know they have these military ties to, to other countries. Thank you. Oh well, at this on the hundredth anniversary, I mean I it's really hard to say, but I, I've heard that uh, Xi Jinping, of course, he doesn't it's a big deal for the hundredth anniversary and um, so, of course, catering to domestic politics, you don't want countries to be angry and declaring war on you. So on one hand, there's one argument that uh, China may try to lay things low. On the other hand, China doesn't want to be slighted and insulted. So if the U.S. is going to continue to heap criticism on China, China is going to push back or fight back because it does, they don't want to look weak when they're going to have a big party for the 100th anniversary. So uh, it's, it's hard to say. You can go in either direction that it can work either for or against um, regional stability and peace. Great, thank you. Okay, this will be the last question. Um, this is also from our student. Um, do you think greater small state contribution to collective defense is a feasible goal for American administrations? And um, I think um, Patrick is referring to um, initiatives such as Quad. So linking, I mean, linking this to smaller states, probably in Southeast Asia. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if I uh, follow the question 100%, but is it about having other smaller states, so not countries like India or now, Australia, which are more middle powers, but getting other uh, states in addition to those on board. Um, I mean, there is, I said the U.S. has, uh, this is from the Obama era, but the U.S. did try to make a more concerted effort to reach out to other states in the region. This is when the U.S., uh, it, it gave ASEAN basically a, a diplomatic stand and assigned an ambassador to ASEAN, there's now a regular U.S. ASEAN dialogue. Um, and we also see uh, under the Trump administration, you know, Pompeo is going to these small Pacific islands. Um, the Maldives, or in South Asia, we have Maldives, but in the South Pacific, you have, um, 
I'm blank. Uh, you need, you, uh, you need to help me out. But the point is, there have been a lot of uh, uh, investments within this region, and and so they are. I, this isn't necessarily directed at defense, um, although the Maldives is because of the status of forces um, agreement. Um, there's uh, they're certainly trying. They're certainly reaching out, but whether you can have collective defense, it goes back to Ian's point about. You know how formalized it's going to be, and I I would say it's you know I, I'm I'm we're not talking about a multilateral alliance here, but in terms of reaching out to smaller states to contribute uh, to global goods, um, I do think the U.S. is making that effort. Thank you so much. Uh, we are um, at eight eleven, so thank you so very much, um, everyone. One, I really appreciate um, our speakers joining us from Asia all in the morning, um, and also all of the attendees. And also, uh, lastly but not least, um, Christiana, Kate, and Asha, uh, who work from behind the scene to make this event possible. Um, I thank everyone so very much, and um, this will conclude our event. And I hope to see you again soon at another AU Korea event. Thank you so much. <laughs>